Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. This is going to be talking, this is Nigel Hicks here, and we're going to be talking this evening about underwater photography. So uh, there's some of the techniques and some of the results that you can get. This is looking, uh, well, all the photography you're going to see in this, uh, in, in this presentation this evening is in tropical waters taken either in the Philippines or in the Maldives. So we're looking really at tropical coral reefs and the animals that live around those coral reefs. I'm going to show you a set of uh, stills images to start with, and then right at the end, I've got a little video to show you, which is um, shot mostly in the Maldives, a little bit of it in the Philippines, but mostly in the Maldives. Uh, just a nice three and a half minute video, which uh, is just kind of rather pleasant and relaxing to watch. So I'm just going to push on with this. So let's carry on with what we're going to, going to be looking at. So what is it? What am I going to be showing you? What is underwater photography? What we're going to be looking at sort of a whole host of things ranging really from pretty familiar animals like turtles, right, which are surprisingly common on coral reefs. So lots, uh, a lot more of them around than you might, might imagine these days. Uh, and then obviously fish, uh, you get a variety of shoals. This particular type of fish is called uh, a rainbow runner. And you see these around, around some of the Philippine reefs. Uh, when you see them, they're usually in quite large numbers. You don't see them all that often, but when you do, they're in quite large shoals like this one. And then um, my personal love is the corals. Uh, this is a, this is a um, called a, a Gorgonian sea fan, which, which is a kind of a soft coral, which means it doesn't build a, a calcium skeleton. Um, it's but it but they're quite common on the reefs down at sort of about 20 meters or 70 feet down below the surface. And they are just these fantastic colors. And this is sort of the other, some of the photography that I really like. I, sometimes when I'm out with other divers, we come back and they say, oh, there wasn't a lot to see today. And I think, wow, that's, that's strange. I, I saw all sorts of fantastic corals, but they're thinking about sharks and stingrays and turtles and things, which if you don't see those, then apparently you've seen nothing. If you're on a coral reef, you should be looking at lots of the corals. So you know, those are the three main areas that we're going to be looking at in terms of photography is the, uh, reptiles, most especially uh, uh, the turtles, and then also uh, fish, and then the coral species. So anyway, what are what are the sort of the challenges of trying to capture all this stuff underwater? What are the challenges of underwater photography? Um, I couldn't resist putting in just one list of points. It's largely to remind me what to say as much as anything. Of course, the first challenge of, the whole, of underwater photography is, is underwater, which obviously immediately makes things pretty difficult. And you need, number two, you have to be able to, to either scuba dive or at the very least snorkel. It has to be said that actually uh, doing underwater photography while snorkeling is a lot harder than it, than it is when you're scuba diving. Um, trying to dive under the surface when you're snorkeling is much harder. and It's much harder to control your buoyancy. And also, of course, a lot of the really interesting stuff doesn't live near the surface, you have to go down rather deeper than is possible with snorkeling, unless you're going to become an expert in free diving, which is a whole other niche altogether. And uh, so you really need to be able to scuba dive or snorkel, in which case you've got quite a bit of training ahead of you just to be able to go underwater, let alone the photography. Then the next challenge is actually, obviously, the, the light intensity falls off very quickly when you, when you go down, um, down below water, once you get down to about 20 meters. It's quite not exactly gloomy, but light level is not fantastic. And also, there's um, well, I've, number four, loss of white light underwater. So the, the color balance changes. The red lights are uh, the red light is absorbed very quickly, just in the first five meters or so of water. And then, so once you've down, it's uh, ten meters or more, thirty feet or more. It's really just blue light, and everything looks quite blue. Or you can see the colors of many of the corals and the fish and so on, but they're a little bit muted and most of the color that you see certainly out in the water uh, is quite blue. But so if, you need to, if you want to put in white lights to really show up the colors of, of the corals and the fish uh, to, the, to their best, you really need to use flash lighting, which in, in, photog in underwater photography is called strobes. I'm not sure why it's called strobes rather than flash. But anyway, you need to use flash lighting to really put in the white light to put in the, to really show the strength of the colors. Although with your eyes, you can generally see what what most colors are under the water. The, the, the camera doesn't record those colors terribly well unless you're using a flash. The next challenge is that all the, the water you're diving in is never tap water. It's always got some suspended material, uh, particularly in 
in temperate waters, but in, even in tropical waters too, the water is never completely clear. There's always some some junk floating around, and this will if, will cause backscatter. If you're using a flash to, to light up your subject, there will that will interfere with the lighting or cause backscatter, and you get all sorts of uh, spec, uh, specks and specules of, of light scattered across your your image, and that that could be quite a problem. Two 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 ways to try to overcome this problem of backscatter from uh, suspended matter in the water. The first is to come really close to your subject. So using, using wide angle lenses, coming in really very close, really just, um, just a foot or two, if you possibly can, maybe three or four feet. Obviously, if you've got something that's very shy and it's going to swim away, if you, uh, if you get too close, then, then that, they, they, that has to be a, a little bit of a balance going on there. So wide angle lenses and also and coming in very close and also with the flash you don't usually the best results don't normally have the flash directly mounted on the camera or, or, or directly above the the uh, the lens because if you if you have the, have the flash right up against the camera then you're flying straight at the subject and any 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 specks of, uh, of of muck that are in the water will just bounce the a lot of the light straight back at the camera so you'll get all sorts of speckled highlights in the water as well as light light bouncing off the subject as well. So the best way of handling underwater photography flash lighting is to have two flash flash guns mounted off to either side and, and quite some distance off to either side and then angled to home in on your on your subject. So that means that when they when they hit the subject they, the light bounce off bounces off and doesn't you don't get too too strong a, a highlight uh, on the on the subject bouncing back to the camera, and also you don't get too so or you don't get so much um, light bouncing back off um, speckles of, of muck that's in the water. The problem with, with then with this setup, of course, is that the equipment starts to become rather bulky. You've got these long arms to hold the flash guns, and uh, which could, so it could be quite awkward to handle on when you're on on, on land, and even in water, it could be awkward to handle. But also it becomes rather bulky because the whole setup has to be built to resist the very high pressures that you might that the equipment's going to be experiencing. Uh, if you go down to 10 meters, the, the or 30 feet, the, the pressure doubles in that distance, and then it goes up by another atmosphere. So it goes from one atmosphere to two atmospheres in the first 10 meters, and then to to, to three atmospheres when you go down to uh, 20 meters, and four atmospheres when you go down to 30 meters. 30 meters is the maximum depth you're allowed to go with this kind of scuba diving. So the, the, all the equipment, the camera body and the uh, flash guns, really have to be built to resist quite high pressure. So that so that combined with the long arms to, to mount your flash guns, it, it makes the whole thing quite bulky. And when you're on land, it's quite heavy as well. Once you're in the water, it doesn't weigh much at all, if anything. So that's um, uh, so that, that, that's not quite so bad. And so, of course, um, there's always a danger of, of leaks, even no matter how well the camera body is built or the housing that houses the camera body is built. The, there's always the weak point, which is where, where you have to sort of open up, be able to open up the, 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 um, the camera's housing to put the camera into it. And so there's always the possibility of leaks if, if, if it's not a perfect seal. And they've, people always say that you're not a proper underwater photographer until you've had a camera flood on you and, and just be destroyed by the water. And I, it, it, I've, I've had it happen to me, and it is a really dire, depressing experience when you when you see the water get in there and you feel the camera just die on you, and you were sort of down trying to photograph the, the particular project, and, the, and you've got this hunk of metal and plastic in your hand, which becomes completely useless, and it's it's a really horrible feeling. Anyway, so moving on. <laughs> uh, also, particular problems associated with the diving. Of course, you have limited time underwater, so you don't, uh, you, you can't just, you can't hang around too much. You've got to get maximum generally of about an hour at, at most, so you've got to get your shots in. Water currents can cause a problem, and this is just not just uh, tides coming and going. You can have localized currents that can go in all sorts of directions. You can go in one direction one minute and go, then change and go in a different direction a few minutes later, so it can cause you problems. It can be very exhausting trying to swim against the current. So you, as often as possible, you try to work with the current and, and go with it. So often you do what's called a drift dive, which is a boat drops you off at one point, which is up current of your target area. 
and then you just drift down on the on the currents along your target area that you want to photograph and then, and then the boat picks you up uh, down down currents downstream of, of where you've uh, where you've been photographing. Obviously there's always a danger of accidents and the risk to health with, with diving. It, the equipment is incredibly good and it's very strictly controlled the way you dive is very strictly controlled these days. So there are actually accidents are incredibly unusual thank, thankfully. And as long as you follow the rules and have the right gear, then it's 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 quite unusual to have any major issues. And uh, touch wood, so far I've not really had any, any any serious incidents. And then back to the photography right at the very end. Once you've done all this photography and got your pictures, then those these underwater images need a lot of post processing, post photography processing to make them look really good. There will always be some speckles of dirt in the water that are reflecting light. There will always be color balance issues, which will not, it will not be quite right. Uh, just it could be a lot of work associated with getting these pictures looking uh, as they should be. So I'm going to show you a few pictures that illustrate some of the points I've just come up with. And this is the first one. This is a coral reef uh, in, in the Maldives. And this illustrates the point of, of just how blue the light is and, and that was the kind of picture you get when the camera's flash doesn't, either doesn't fire at all, doesn't fire properly. In this instance, uh, there has been a bit of a flash fire, but not, in, not it hasn't fly, fired correctly for one reason or another. So you see it right in the foreground. Some of these corals that you've got here have, have, have got lit, become lit up and they've got a little sort of a, a nice whitish or pinkish um, lighting to them, but very quickly everything becomes blue. And all the corals in the background certainly are completely blue. And even you see there are hundreds of fish in there, which are also, they are actually blue. But because everything in the in the background there is blue, they don't show up terribly well. In the foreground here, where we've got a little bit of lighting to show up a little bit more, but back here, they just become part of the general rather bluey scene. This is what happens when flash doesn't fire, either doesn't fire at all or doesn't fire properly. This is what happened. This is what's supposed to happen when you get the flash fire, firing properly. This is again same kind of coral, but with with the flash firing on it. It's the same same dive site, but different location. And you see now we've got really everything lit up quite nicely and, and they're showing up here as a kind of a browny orange color with white tips, which is, which is what they are, what you see when you're actually there. And you can see obviously the light intensity falls off quite quickly. You've got these corals right in front of the camera, which are well lit up, in fact, a little bit too bright in one or two places, but then a few feet away from the camera and the, and the light starts to fall off. These, uh, by, by the way, are, uh, what's called a hard coral, corals that produce a, a calcium skeleton, and these are what build, really build the, the coral reef structures, and can really build up huge solid and permanent structures which can actually create entire islands. It's this kind of coral which, um, which make, make the calcium structures, and on the cal each arm of this calcium structure you'll find hundreds of the co coral polyps. And they form these 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 communities on these calcium structures that they build together. And it's quite quite an amazing thing, and you won't be surprised. And well, the scientific name for this particular type of coral is Acropora, and there are lots of different species of Acropora, but in English, this particular type of coral is called staghorn, which you'll not be surprised to hear to looking at the at their shape. Staghorn really is quite descriptive. Anyway, moving on, the, the lighting angle issue, this is what I've already, already described, so I think you can probably understand it quite easily. This is on, on the left, this is what happens if you have a flash mounted directly on the camera, it fires straight at, at your subject, in this case a fish, and then bounces, if you're lucky, it bounces back from the fish and gets back to the camera, but an awful lot of it also hits bits of dirt in the water and either bounces away, or if you're unlucky, bounces straight back into the camera as well, so you get all these little bright spots of light in the in your picture which really rather ruin the picture if on the right as on the right you've got two flash guns mounted on either side then the lighting becomes a little bit more becomes a little bit easier in that a lot more of the lighting that hits these speckles in the water bounces away from the from the um, from the camera lens and doesn't go into it obviously some does but not as much as in the situation where the, where the flash gun is directly on the camera if you've got the got the flash gun off to the off to the left or, or way off to, way off to one side, 
and you're only using one flash gun, what happens is that you have one side of the subject brightly lit and the other side in deep shadow. So that's why you usually have a second uh, flash gun to, to balance that so, so the whole subject is evenly lit. But it does make the whole thing quite cumbersome. So here hello, is, hello, yes. Yes, Laurie, uh, just wonder, is there any advantage to using continuous lighting, you know, like LED or something like that? Um, you, if, you, if you're doing video, then yes, you would. If you wanted, wanted to use lighting, I often don't use lighting for, my, for the video I do, actually, surprisingly. But uh, yeah, if you, generally, if you only use uh, continuous lighting if they're doing video. But the problem, of course, is that you, you, even with LEDs, you will run out of battery power fairly quickly. Yeah. Although uh, I think that problem is increasingly solved. I see more and more LED lights on the market, actually. So I think that perhaps that's been solved. I'm not sure. So this is, uh, in terms of equipment, this is my my setup. It, it does look terribly cumbersome, and it's it's a uh, it, you see it, some a lot of people are using smaller systems these days. But uh, I'm not sure. Um, it, most people who are doing some fairly serious professional photography, more serious and more professional, as in making up a greater chunk of their work than, than mine, using stuff that looks even more horrendous than this. So this is the camera that I use. It's just a Canon PowerShot G1X Mark II, and it fits inside this, this housing. And you see on it, it has G1X Mark II. So you've got to, it, which means you've got to have a housing that is exactly right for your camera model. So every time you change your camera, you've got to buy a whole new housing as well. And these, these things are really not cheap. So it's, it's quite an expensive process. And two flash guns mounted on either side. You, have, you usually have um, the main flash, a main flash, and then a fill-in flash. And the main flash is on your on your left side, so on the right-hand side of this picture. And you'll see there's a cable linking this flash to the camera. And this, this so the camera fires the fires this flash, and then the fill-in flash on the right is fired as a as a slave cell by a slave cell. There's no cable connecting this one to the camera. And very, usually, what was you obviously your, your right hand is holding. Your right hand is holding the camera and with a finger on the, the shutter button, and your left hand will actually take this holder off its off its mount here, and you will hand hold this flash so you can change the position of the flash according to the angle of your of your subject and move it around a bit, and, and change the lighting somewhat. So so you've got your cat got the camera in your right hand and the, and, this, and the main flash in your left, and then the the, um, the slave the slave flash the fill-in flash. Just stays mounted on on, on on the on the camera, on the camera holding. This is just looks at the at the, at the housing, and this shows you why every housing has to be specific to each camera model because you've got all these buttons and all sorts of levers all over it, which enable you to actually press and, and operate all the controls that are on the camera body uh, while you're underwater. It's a bit of a fiddly process, and they don't always work. It has to be said, but uh, usually it does. Uh, and but it does it does mean that all these buttons are going to be in exactly the right place for your particular camera model. So it means that if you say if you change your camera model, you've got to change your your housing as well. And here on this side, you'll see that a pretty strong looking clip, which actually is is the uh, to make sure the back of the, the uh, back of the housing is closed once you've got the camera in. So and then you have quite a large port, which you saw, which you saw in the previous picture which is glass, obviously, that's all got to be pretty solid and able to resist um, quite a few uh, atmospheres. You see over here, it's, it's been tested, this housing has been tested at 60 metres, so that's seven atmospheres of pressure. So it's quite a significant one. Not that you ever will ever dive, not, not the kind of scuba diving that I'm doing anyway, you ever dive to 60 metres, as I already said, 30 metres is the maximum you're allowed to go to. It used to be 40 metres when I first started, it was 40 metres, but it's... Uh, the rules have been tightened. Anyway, let's carry on with the, with the photography. And this is the before and after, which really uh, demonstrates to you just, just how much work has, may, may or usually has to go into processing the pictures afterwards. On the left, obviously, is, is the before. You see the color balance is wrong. The flash has fired, but despite that, the color balance is really not right. It's the, the yucky green. And there's an awful lot of crap floating around in the water. 
This one is particularly bad. It's not always this bad by a long way, but I, I thought I'd put in one that is particularly bad and show you the results I eventually ended up with once I'd really worked on it hard for quite some time. Did This particular picture did take a long time to, to get right. But this really illustrates why you need post photography processing, uh, at least for underwater photography. And the next shot shows you what happens if, it, if the flash doesn't fire at all. Completely blue. You don't see much of the junk in the water either, so that's quite nice. So you end up with quite, quite a, picture that, a picture that's quite clear of any junk, but the picture is um, stubbornly blue. You can do quite a bit of post photography processing in the computer, and you can change the color balance to improve it, but it never quite comes as right as it does when you've used a flash gun. Usually, find if you put in a lot of extra red, uh, put the color temperature up quite a long way, so you increase yellow, so it, 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 that will, will help, but it never quite gets there. Also, using a flash gun it enables you to use a rather slower shutter speed than you can under than you can with, without one. And, and so if the flash doesn't fire, you'll often end up with a picture that's not quite as crisp as, uh, as it is with the, uh, when you fire it with the flash. But anyway, that's, that's the same view, obviously the horizontal version, shot without any flash. And, and again, also not processed to try to improve the color balance. But, uh, anyway, so I thought I'd throw in this little shot. This is a diver's eye view when you're coming back to the boat after a dive. This is a, in the Philippines, this is a typical Philippines boat with um, outriggers on both sides of the boat. You, um, in Polynesia, in the Pacific, you'll see outrigger, uh, boats with outriggers on just the one side. But in the Philippines, they always have outriggers on both sides. And this, this actually was a, a snorkeling trip to actually swim with, with whale sharks, which you'll see a bit of a little, uh, later on. But this is the kind of typical sort of scene you get as you're coming back at the end of a dive. Now, this is uh, one, of my, one of my personal favorites for my diving, but I've realized a lot of people don't get this picture. And I've realized because it is, it's the great majority of people never see the, under, the underwater world, whether it, whether in temperate, world, temperate environments or tropical environments. So I think it's quite a difficult to interpret what's going on in this shot for a lot of people. Well, what this is, is uh, if I find my view, this is one huge coral, it's about two meters across. And I'm coming in very close to it, actually a little bit too close. I'm actually on a, on a, on a drift dive here. The current is pushing me closer and closer to this, to this coral. So I'm actually struggling to get, get it all in because I'm getting closer to it all the time. And the flash gun is fired perfectly. Uh, we got this sh showing up this stunning red color. And I could see there that, that, it, that it was red, um, but it wasn't any, anything like as strong a red as, as this. And over on the left side, bottom left, off bottom left corner, we got another coral. This is a, called a brain coral, which is kind of hard coral. This particular type of coral, this red one, is called a, a, a Gorgonian sea fan, similar to the one I showed you earlier. Uh, and this is a kind of a soft coral, it, meaning it doesn't produce a calcium skeleton. So it doesn't build up these huge structures, uh, reef structures. But um, this one, this, this one in the bottom left is a hard coral. It does produce a calcium skeleton. And this black stuff here, these are actually starfish, feather stars, because so, their arms are very feathery. You don't see them in temperate waters, so you don't see them around Britain anyway. But you do see them quite a bit in Southeast Asia. They're quite a common kind of starfish, quite remarkable to look at. So this is uh, so all one huge coral here, another one down here. Actually, another one over on the left here as well, and then starfish here. And it, you can see this is a very steep slope. But this is a typical environment where you see these kinds of corals. And here's another one. This is another Gorgonian sea fan, this time on a, on a totally vertical wall. And this is really typical of both, the, well, most especially in the Philippines, but also in, in the Maldives as well, that you have a shallow area going off, off, the, off the shore, away from the shore, and then you get what's called a reef crest, which is where you've got huge areas of corals built up. And then suddenly the, 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 the ground will just drop away in this incredible cliff down into deep, deep water. And this is where you get these, so these um, Gorgonian sea fans growing. And they're often in quite strong currents. So, so, so the water pushes, you might say the water blows plankton through the arms of these corals. And that's how, they, that, how the corals get their food. They're catching plankton in, in their arm, in the arms of these, uh, of these, of these corals. As, uh, as the current is driving the plankton through. And over here, we've got another hard coral, another hard coral up here, another hard coral up here. And all this red stuff is what is a very um, simple creature called a sponge.
And there's loads of that on the on these reefs. And it, this kind of shot really um, I should, illustrates how difficult it can be to work out the orientation of, of pictures from un, from underwater scenes. If you wanted to turn your head on on on, on your onto your right shoulder, you might think it actually would look better as a vertical shot with the coral going upwards. But actually, it would be it would be wrong. I, I did have one shot a years years a few years ago, which was used a number of times in magazines and books, and they always, always published it the wrong way up because <laughs> it was really hard to get get the whole thing um, get, to work out which way up it should be. And it, and it was always on, on, should have been on its side like this. You can always tell which way one of these one of these pictures should be is because of the the open water here is very is down below. It's dark, and as you go towards the surface, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. So you know that the, the light is always upwards. Uh, and so that you get you know, the orientation of the of the image or how it should be. And here we go, go uh, with just one of the divers. This is actually is the, the dive master who's actually a professional diver who leads, uh, has a local knowledge of the local person and they lead, they lead, a group of, lead a group of divers. Sometimes when I'm in a place photographing for, for a magazine or book project, uh, they will give me just a dive master and we'll go off on our own. Other times I'll, I'll be sharing it with, with a group of other divers and, and with, with the dive master. But this, um, this, this, on this occasion, I was with a group, but this was the dive master who was hanging around me to, to, to make sure that I was concentrating on the diving and not just the photography, which sometimes happens when you're photographing, you forget to, take, to, to pay attention to the actual um, techniques of the diving that you should be doing. But anyway, just look at, you just see this is, his, his, this is in the Maldives. This is the dive master that was leading dive. See on his, her air tank on the back, it says nitrox there, which means actually it's not totally air. It, what it is, it's a, just a mixture of nitrogen and, and oxygen in which the oxygen has been enriched above the usual 20% that you have in air. It's enriched up to about 22% or so, uh, which enables uh, on a dive that would last about an hour for an air tank, nitrox, you can stay down for about an extra 15 or 20 minutes, so that gives you a bit of extra time. On her left wrist is a dive confusion that tells all the details about how deep she's, she's been, how deep she is now, um, how much uh, lo longer she's allowed to stay down, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and what the water temperature is, all sorts of uh, data gets recorded so you know. Uh, and it will also calculate how, um, how long you have to wait before you can do a second dive. So if you're doing two or three dives a day, this is important information to, to telling you how long you have to go back to the surface to wait before you can then, then safely do another dive. And over on, on her right side here, you'll see, we see that she's breathing through a regulator here linked to her tank. This is called, so this mouthpiece is called a regulator. And here over here, a yellow one, there's a, a second regulator. And that's for emergencies. Emergencies not for her, but for any other diver who, who has an emergency, perhaps either their regulator that they're using breaks or they run out of air or something, they can grab this and, uh, and stick it in their mouth and, and then they'll be okay. And then the two divers will go back to the surface together. So there's all sorts of fail-safe features on, on the equipment when you're, while you're diving. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so then Another, yet more Gorgonian sea fans. I love photographing these. This all comes, comes up in an awful lot of my photography. <laughs> but it, one of the problems of diving with a group of divers, it can be great for actually putting in pictures if they're in the right angle, but often they get in the, get in the wrong, get in the way as well. They're, more often than not, they're in the wrong place for the photo that you want to get. And you have limited time to get the shot you want because, as I say, there's usually a current pushing you along a little bit. And so you've got only a few seconds in which to get the shot. But they, anyway, um, that's why we have Photoshop, of course, is to get rid of things that you don't really want in the picture, which don't uh, perhaps necessarily contribute to the, to the shot. So continuing on, this is um, a sea anemone. And I've got showing you this for two reasons. Firstly, this little fish over here on the side here, this is a, a clownfish or an anemone fish. You'll see time and time again, these tiny little fish that actually live in the sea anemones and they're quite um, feisty little things. They'll come out and defend the sea anemone against all comers, including divers. Just the one here, but you often see groups of them in, in, in the, in the uh, tentacles of the sea anemone. And these tentacles, they have stinging cells and that, they're designed to, to catch and kill uh, their, their prey. But these little fish, that they are immune to the, to the, to the stingers. They don't get, get, uh, get injured by them at all. So these, these are primarily going to be effective against uh, shrimps and uh, uh, 
plankton and all sorts of other creatures. So th this sea anemone, this is all a single cell creature. So this is one of the world's largest single cellular creatures. But the second reason I'm showing it to you is because you see the tentacles are all being blown over to the, put from left to right. And that is just I put this in just to illustrate the currents that can really affect you sometimes. We're down here, sort of perhaps around about 20 meters or 65 feet or so. So there's no wave action. Uh, it's, this is really purely current that is pushing along from left to right. And so that's some, I would have grabbed this shot as I drifted by. And it's, it's, as I said, it's very hard work to swim against the current. So you, you do that as little as you can, as, you, as little as you have to, because obviously the more, more paddling and more working you do to swim against the current, the quick, more quickly you use up your air. So you, you, you shoot as you can, as and when you can, with uh, using up as little air as you can get away with. Um, this is a what I mentioned earlier, a feather star, a starfish with these really feathery arms. And this, this shot really is to illustrate that uh, the rules of composition still apply to underwater photography in, in that ideally you're always aiming to have a single strong subject that dominates your frame that doesn't necessarily fill the frame and which, in which there is nothing else in the frame that is competing for attention. And okay, this area of sponge and coral below it is a little bit messy, a little bit distracting, but it's an essential part of the, of the environment and, and of, of the story of the starfish living on this on this substrate here. But behind the starfish, there's really very little. The, the, the light falls away very quickly. It all just becomes a blue-green sort of backdrop. And so you have a single strong subject that jumps out at you, which completely dominates the frame and takes your attention. Similarly, or perhaps like I say, not similarly in many ways, this hawksbill turtle. Wonderful thing to photograph. They're, they're great to shoot, but they're not really too bothered by human presence. Um, again, it, it dominates the frame, but perhaps not quite so much because obviously the backdrop is a lot more co complex and a lot more detail there. So it, it's, it's distracting uh, to some extent. This, the turtle doesn't pop out from the background as much as that, as, that, uh, uh, as that feather star did. But nevertheless, this background does sort of set the scene and, and describe the turtle's environment. And uh, this is this is taken in the in the Maldives. One of the great things about turtles is when I first started diving over 20 years ago in the Philippines, you didn't see turtles all that often. And when they when you did, they were terrified. When they saw a human, they would scuttle off at quite a speed, uh, because at that time uh, it had only just become illegal to hunt turtles, and so they were still used to being chased by people who were going to eat them or at least take their shells and sell the shells for tourist trinkets, etc. But nowadays, I've noticed firstly that turtles are a lot more common on the reefs. And secondly, they don't really bother about humans anymore. You, you can swim right up to them and they'll swim alongside you quite happily. And they're really not at all bothered by your presence, which is just fantastic. It's one at last a positive change to actually be, be, be happy about rather than all the bad news. This is actually quite a, a nice positive uh, uh, change that, that's happened over the last, very slowly and imperceptibly over the last 20 years. And then uh, shoulder snappers in the, in the Maldives. One of the problems you often have with, shoulder, with shoulders of fish is that they're very sensitive to, to a divers approaching and quite often, not always, but often they'll swim away rather gently away from you so you often photographing the backs of the, of the fish as they swim away, which is slightly annoying, but you still end up with some, with some uh, lovely compositions and lovely colours. This is taken with a flash, flash has fired, but this is the water's not too deep. And these snappers are such a beautiful colour that, they, that their yellows show up beautifully anyway, uh, even without the flash. So uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a nice, it's quite a pleasure to get this kind of shot. Now, this is a, obviously a very different kind of fish picture. This is taken from underneath a shoal of sardines looking up at the surface. And this is a, a shoal that's been estimated to be about a million, a million fish. And, and so when you're under it, it gets incredibly dark. And this is a, a shoal of sardines that shows up at the same time of day, every day, at this particular location off the coast of Cebu in the south of the Philippines. And... Um, uh, it's it, to say it, it occurs quite reliably at about three o'clock every afternoon. And when my, my dive master told me about this, he said it gets really very, very dark underneath it. I didn't really believe him, but my goodness, 
when I was under the shoal like this, um, it was quite hard to get enough light, even with the flash fire firing, I had to really fire pointing up towards the surface to actually have enough light coming down through the fish to actually light anything up. And obviously sardines are quite grey, silvery fish anyway, so they don't get a whole lot of colour. It's just got a bit of light from the flash bouncing off the edges of the fish. But it really, I think this illustrates for really this huge crowd of fish. As I say, it's been at this shoal that as I say, shows up every day. So it, estimated about a million sardines. And then moving on, now most of people, when, when you think of underwater photography, it's really um, sharks and whales and so on, that people really catch, capture people's imagination, not surprisingly. And sharks, also, of course, also conjure up the idea of, of immense danger and threats, and the, the risk that you take when you're diving close to them. In actual fact, certainly in Southeast Asia, the great majority of sharks are you know, perfectly safe to be in here. There's only a handful of species that are genuinely dangerous. So I've been with sharks a number of times and, and it's really, generally speaking, there's nothing much to worry about. It's, uh, they mind their own business. They look fierce, they look threatening, but there's only a couple of species that we need to worry about. In Southeast Asia, the biggest danger uh, I would say, is this fella in this picture here, this is the banded sea snake. Now this is lethal, its bite is deadly, um, uh, but as with most wildlife, it's not going to attack you as long as you don't cause any trouble. Most animals really don't want to attack, they, they want to just get away. And as long as you don't block off its, its exit route, as long as you don't go doing anything, interfering with it at all, you're not going to get attacked. So I was quite happy to come in close to this this, um, this snake. Remember, I'm using a wide angle lens, so I'm coming in really very close, just a few feet away, a couple of feet away, and uh, but making sure it still had an e could could uh, had an e had an exit point to, to swim away from me, which it did use to get to get to move off. And um, this did get has been used in in my book Wild Philippines. And I know when a Philippine friend of mine saw this picture, they said they, they said that was they were really very impressed and pleased that I got this shot because they said every diver they'd ever seen uh, when one of these snakes appeared had been uh, you know, quite keen to swim as fast as possible in the opposite direction away from them because they do have such a bad reputation. But uh, I've never, I've come across them many, many times and never really felt in danger from them. So I'm always uh, quite happy to try and get a, get a picture if I can. Anyway, talking back to sh on, on with sharks. This is a, not a very, photographically not a very, great good picture it but it's quite a quite a, an illustrative one if you can work out what it is i'm actually snorkeling in, in this shot i'm at the surface I'm, I'm photographing downwards towards these it's two sharks here and th these are called nurse sharks which are this shark in the foreground is quite big he's about four meters long so 13 feet or so but they're both asleep and they've got their heads buried in this tiny cave so it's like a bit like ostriches burying their heads in the sand they got their heads in the cave, but their bodies are, are sort of st sticking out across the reef, you know, completely visible to, to everybody. And uh, just quietly there having a snooze. It wasn't that long ago that it was believed that sharks had to stay on the move all the time. And nobody, and, and that was until a few people started to record pictures like this of sharks sleeping. When you see the video in a minute, you'll see, see this again. Uh, of these, these these two sharks asleep and, uh, with their heads in this cave and their bodies out across the roof. Quite strange, really. Well, I assume you didn't use a flash on that one, Nigel. Uh, I didn't actually, no, but I, 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 very close to the surface. I was a bit concerned about disturbing them, it's true, so I didn't have a flash firing. Um, not sure if I had actually had, because I was only snorkeling, I'm not sure if I had a flash mounted at all. Actually, I think I may not have bothered with a flash actually because I was just snorkeling at the surface. But, yeah. Anyway, another another fish that I didn't use a flash with because you're not allowed to. This is uh, a whale shark. This is the world's biggest fish photographed in the Philippines. You see, it, it, this, this is its eye here. So you can see that's a, a really huge mouth. Um, so like, but like Britain's basking shark, it's a plankton feeder, so it's perfectly um, harmless. Uh, it's just big, that's, that's its only problem. Uh, uh, problem from our point of view, but it, it's just an incredible fish. And uh, there's a few places in the Philippines where you'll 
almost guaranteed sightings and you get get pretty close to them. In fact, this particular location called Donsol, you do accidentally end up getting really close. Um, there are some international rules on how you're supposed to interact with whale sharks put together by the Australians, which say that you're not supposed to get less than three metres. Uh, you're not get, you're supposed to get closer than three metres to these whale sharks. But unfortunately, at Donsol, if you're three metres away from these whale sharks, you can't see them because the water is so cloudy. There's so much plankton in the water that, uh, that you just can't see anything at three metres. And that's, of course, is why the uh, whale sharks are there, because there's so much plankton in the water. But the trouble is that then uh, if you're in the water around them somewhere, they just suddenly loom up out of the, out of the gloom right coming, coming straight towards you and you don't have much time to get out of the way. So you end up with this kind of thing where you do actually get bumped by the whale shark as it goes by, which is obviously completely against the rules, but some, often something you just cannot do anything about because they're, they're moving pretty slowly by their standards, but actually you realise that they're, they're cruising along at quite a speed, which uh, uh, is quite, quite, quite remarkable. And um, so this is the kind of shot you end up with, some very close shots. As I say, no flash, because you're not allowed to use a flash, you're just snorkeling right at the surface. And uh, you end up with some interesting details like this. So here we have uh, the markings on the fish, and then you have the interplay of, of sunlight from these are the ripples on the uh, lights showing up the ripples on the surface of the water, which is just a foot or so above, above me. And just end up with these amazing detail shots of, this, of these whale sharks. You know, the last couple of pictures, all the sh shots I've shown you so far have been used, taken using a wide angle lens. The last couple are taken uh, with macros. So They're coming in really close on quite small pictures. Just a couple of it, these images. So I don't do, do this very often. This is a macro shot. This is what's called a soft tree coral. You understand why it's called a tree because it's really very much what it looks like. And it's a soft coral because it doesn't produce calcium. It really is just a, it has a very soft body. And the thing about this kind of this kind of underwater photography, even more so than the, the, the wide angle stuff, is it's almost impossible to get an idea of scale. So this this particular structure, it's only about 10, maybe 15 centimeters tall, so four to six inches, four to 12 inches, I should say. And it's uh, just so, so really very small and just incredibly beautiful. And if you just look at this, these 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 are all the individual coral polyps. Each in, these are each individual animals, and they form this community, and they build together this structure. And they could, their stomachs, the stomach they have on each individual coral polyp, can communicate with all the others via this structure. So what, what, whatever one pot coral polyp is able to, to capture in terms of food, that food becomes available to all the others in the community as well. So in terms of photography, is taken with a, a macro. Uh, lens and with with just I've just used one single flash gun here coming down from sort of top left down onto the subject here. This is uh, so this area over here in a little bit of shadow. Uh, so over here is quite brightly lit. Um, this was actually taken quite a long time ago, but in in the Philippines, and uh, this is still one of my favourite uh, underwater pictures that I've taken. And then the final coral shot is this one. This is somewhat bigger, about 20 centimeters or eight inches across. It's called bubble coral. And it's quite remarkable because although it looks like soft coral, it is actually a hard coral in the sense it produces a calcium skeleton. And uh, that's, um, so it's, but that calcium skeleton is hidden underneath these, these, these bubble structures. And this again was photographed macro lens with a, with a single flash gun coming down from top left. So this left-hand side of the, of the coral is quite well lit, whereas the right-hand side is in deep shadow. Had I had a second flash gun over on the right, then this area would have been better lit as well. So um, finally, I th thought I'd really make you all sick by showing you this picture, which is kind of the kind of environment that you're often working in when you're doing this kind of uh, underwater photography in the tropics. This is in the in, in Bohol in the south of the Philippines. And this particular shot, just to make you doubly sick, was actually taken on the day that the beast from the east struck Britain. So I was feeling particularly smug on this day, sitting on this boat and doing this wonderful diving. Um, well, one of the things about diving is that even if, you're, even if this is work, it doesn't feel like work, partly because the environment is so wonderful, but also because you're, you, you, you're forced to take rests, not allowed to continually dive hour after hour underwater. First of all, your air is only going to last one hour, and then you have to uh, 
take a, a rest for a couple of hours before you're allowed to take, then take a second shorter dive. So you're really resting quite a bit of time, even and it's, and that is actually work. So that's the end of that photography. Just wanted to show you, this is the book where you, if, you, where you, if you wanted to see any of um, that photography, I've just shown you a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of it and more, of course, is, is in this book, Wild Philippines, which came out a couple of years ago now. It's got caught out badly by the COVID pandemic, of course, so selling it has proved to be quite difficult, but it is available, I hope. Um, and it, this book, I, I covered all the, all, all, basically all the natural habitats of the Philippines, from the coral reefs, through mangroves, through lowland forest to, mount, to, to montane or mountain rainforest, up to the right up to the mountain summits, and quite a range, therefore quite a wide range also of the plant and animal species that it, in, inhabits those, those, those different environments. So it was quite a major project, and I said a lot of the underwater photography is in there. So that's kind of the end of that. Just, just the final bit of housekeeping in terms of this particular part of the presentation. There's, as I showed you at the beginning, Beautiful Dorset's now finally available at long last. You can buy it from all good bookstores and for me as well online and also uh, so from Amazon as well. It should be on Amazon too. And then workshops, all my spring and early summer workshops are finished now and I've got six lined up for the autumn. The architectural photography course, which was supposed to be in June, I've actually decided, I decided to delay it until, the, until September, so I'll be on the 25th, and then there's the Atlantic Coast on the 11th of September, and then garden photography, uh, Exmoor Wildlife, Exmoor in Autumn, Dartmoor in Autumn, to running through the autumn, uh, running through October. So that, that's the six workshops, and you, know, you can book those any, any time, of course. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to un briefly unshare my screen, and I'm going to share it again to show you a video. It's just a lovely three and a half minute relaxing video. So we are going to go diving and see what we can see. Hopefully some really good stuff. <laughs> 